Here's a guy who married his wife for about 60 years and he comes home one day and he finds her in bed with his best friend. And he looks down and says, Abby, me, I have to, but you. It's all nonsense, you know what I mean? Political correctness is comedy's biggest threat. I mean, in England, you, you say boo to a goose and you're in trouble. In America, it's even worse. They've got all this transgender and who, uh, you know. Uh, but it, you should be able to speak about anything. If you go into the kitchen, you must just stand the heat, that's all. If you want to say something controversial, that's fine. You must take, be prepared to take the, the backlash, that's all. And it happened to me, I mean, in 1988. I was picked up by the security cops for doing anti-government comedy. And they beat the crap out of me. But today we got freedom of speech. You can say what you like. And that's wonderful. I tell you, that's absolutely wonderful. I, you, you compare this country to America with humor. Our humor is, to my mind, in a lot of ways, far ahead of them because we haven't hit the politically correct thing yet. We will. We will because somebody will get offended and then, you know, stupidity is just there to satisfy the offended. Who do you think is funny or I suppose the funniest person or the person you can poke fun at the most and why? Julius Malema. Because that man, I quote from Peter Ustinov, he says he has very, he's created very low standards for himself. Unfortunately, he can't live up to them. And that's it. He's always a laughing stock because he contradicts himself all the time. And <laughs> you just listen to him and, and you think, oh God, thank God this is not running the country. You know what I mean? Like I always thought of myself, there's no discrimination in my act. I just hate everybody. You know what I mean? And uh, welcome opponents. You know what I mean? And... Uh, I just have fun with people, that's all. And uh, if somebody gets offended, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not here to, 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 to entertain one person. I'm here to entertain the whole crowd, you see. What do I think about the future? I think the future's great. You know, if, if the Zondo Commission, those two thick books that they handed with such pride, if they get, if justice gets to be seen to be done, this country will survive and go forward in leaps and bounds. If the corruption carries on, we're going to go downhill. But they are, I think they're really going to get stuck into the people who are corrupt, you know what I mean? Because we have the best politicians that money can buy. That is a fact. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm in the wrong business. I should have been a politician. I could have made a fortune, man. <laughs> This guy rocks up at a lumber camp in Canada, wanting to be a lumberjack, and he's a small little skinny runt. The guy says to him, well, where did you get your experience? He says, the Sahara forest. The guy says, forest? It's not a forest, it's a desert. He said, now it's a desert. My woodwork, uh, I started woodwork at school, actually, at King Edwards. We used to do manual training, they called it, and that was woodwork, and the major tier, he gave me an interest in wood. And since I was like 17, 18, I've been doing this. I just love working with wood, you know, and I'd, I was doing it as a hobby, I'm just making these things and giving them away as presents. I didn't want to buy presents. My wife said, enough now, you must start selling them because this is costing us money because this wood is expensive, let me tell you. I don't use cheap wood, I use exotic wood, you see. So we went to a market. And funnily enough, it worked. So once a month we go to the market, I make stock and we sell it. So it's become a, a, a bit of a money earner. It's nothing serious, but I do that. Plus uh, corporate gigs I do. I don't do clubs anymore because there's always one dick without a mask who's slightly drunk who wants to breathe on you. <laughs>